All right. Wrong. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to a new episode uh, of The Stock Room. Today, we have uh, Andy Hunter, who is the founder and CEO at Bookshop. Andy, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Really nice to have you. Uh, so why don't you just could you start by telling us a little bit about uh, um, yourself uh, and the uh, bookshop, uh, how the brand was born and uh, what your first year was like? Yeah, well, I had an interesting background. I had been in technology in my late 20s, working at Disney and MGM. Um, and then I took a left turn and got into content and became an editor and writer and later a publisher. And I was publishing books. Um, and and doing a lot of online publishing as well in like from 2009 until 2019 and during that time period i was watching as as amazon was asserting massive dominance over the book publishing industry and i was particularly concerned with its effect on small businesses um, notably independent local bookstores that contribute a lot to the culture around books and also contribute a lot to literacy and the importance of books in the communities that they serve. So I was worried what is going to happen if Amazon keeps gaining market share. They went from 15% to over 50% in about a decade. So over half of every, all the books sold in the U.S. were being sold by Amazon. And that couldn't continue much longer without all the bookstores going out of business. And I felt like that was a, would be a disaster if we allowed it to take place. So I wanted to at least try to create a platform that made it very easy and frictionless for independent bookstores to be able to compete with Amazon for online sales. And that's why Bookshop was was conceived of and born. Um, it was difficult to raise money for it because we were competing with Amazon, which investors generally don't think is a good yeah. idea. Um, and but we did raise a small amount of money under a million dollars and we launched it in about seven months. And part of the reason that we were able to build it and launch it so fast is we built it off of Solidus um, and we added some features to it. Most notably, we added an affiliate, a built, kind of built in affiliate network capacity so that all of the bookstores could be affiliates. And we launched it in January of 2020. We thought we were going to be in a beta period for about six months had nine months until the holidays of 2020. That's when we thought we would really ramp up. But instead, six weeks after we launched the pandemic hit, and with COVID-19, all of the bookstores in the US basically had to close their doors. And online retail became the only way that they could stay in business and serve their customers. So instead of being uh, something that they wanted to get to eventually, it became this incredibly important thing that they had to do immediately. And we scaled very, very rapidly for about six weeks. Yeah, the, the pandemic must have been uh, um, quite the tailwind uh, for you guys. So. Yeah. And, and so double clicking into the, the business model um, for a second, how does the, the business work? So how do you manage to benefit bookstores uh, um, while still selling online and offering that that kind of uh, Amazonish customer experience. Yeah, well, the, the trick is that Bookshop is really a thin layer on top of the e-commerce system. So we don't actually hold inventory. We work with a wholesaler, and the wholesaler Ingram in the U.S. and in the U.K. it's um, Gardner's. The wholesaler does the direct consumer shipping, and so we'll. A bookstore can take an order through their bookshop page or using um, bookshop's affiliate links. That order will then be sent to the wholesaler. The wholesaler sends the book to the customer. If there's customer service issues or anything like that, bookshop takes care of them. Um, the reason that this works so well is because it removes a lot of the barriers that independent bookstores had previously had towards uh, like getting an online shop together like they don't have to worry about whether they have a book in stock um in ingram and gardner's inventories are close to amazon so a 1400 square foot bookstore could have you know 2000 to 3000 books in stock but suddenly they've got millions of books in stock um and they can get a book to a customer in three days so they're suddenly competitive with amazon in terms of inventory and 
turnaround time and shipping time. Um, and also because we, the way that we built the site, you can create a bookshop page and about as difficult as it is to create a Facebook page for your business. You can do it in a half an hour. So there's no, you don't have to hire a web developer or learn anything about web hosting or learn anything about e-commerce. It's easier than mm -hmm. even setting up a Shopify account. So people who had no technical abilities were able to get on Bookshop within a half an hour, and then they could start selling books to their customers immediately. And they didn't have to worry about the fact that their employees were home because of COVID, because they don't need to fulfill any books. We do all the fulfillment and we do all the customer service. So there's no overhead. So it took away all the risks from the small businesses. And it also took away all of the friction and pain points. And then on the customer side, it was just incredibly easy. We made it as easy to support your local bookstore as it is to buy a book on Amazon. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I feel like that's uh, um, an advantage that niche uh, marketplaces uh, have over something like Amazon, uh, which is obviously um, unmatchable in terms of the firepower that they can deploy after a business opportunity. Um, but then on the other hand, they also uh, tend to offer a very generic set of tools uh, to their sellers. Uh, uh, but when you are talking to a very specific audience uh, um, and you get to understand them and how they think about their business, uh, you can offer tools that are built around that. Um, and so, for instance, uh, um, one of the latest interviews that we've done uh, was with the edit which has um, a sneakers marketplace uh, and do something very similar with the resellers uh, where they try to streamline uh, the process of uh, onboarding the sellers uh, um, and offer as many tools as possible for sellers to manage their business uh, without them actually being a business uh, at all. So do you feel like that's part of the success uh, uh, that you've managed to have in this years? Absolutely. Um, and also... There's something about getting into a niche that has the part of somebody's identity is like their devotion to that niche, right? And they can't, that's true for sneakers. Like people who are big sneaker fans. Like they think about it as part of like what, who they are is their yeah. sneaker obsession. Books are the same way, if not more. People who are big book readers and care about books, they are obsessed and they think about it as part of their real identity. Um, and it's something they're proud of. And that is a great, if you're looking for a niche to go for those niches, that's the greatest segments to, to go after the things that are really core to people's identities and their passions. And then you can do it better than Amazon. And, and one of the reasons you do it better than Amazon is because they're generalist marketplaces. They don't particularly, Amazon might've started yeah. with books, but they don't love books. Books are, a, were a tool to get them to a bigger place. Um, Everybody on Bookshop loves books. All the bookstores that are on Bookshop love books and their recommendations are through sincere human intelligence and human emotion, like not paid for by marketing dollars or um, an algorithm determining like what you might want to read next. And I think that those are really powerful. If you look at what people actually, the reasons you personally buy a book, I personally buy a book. It's usually because somebody I trust recommended it to me. Yeah. Um, and so when you go after these niches, the fact that you've got that human touch and that human passion for that niche, I think resonates a lot with consumers. And it's something that just an algorithm or a general marketplace could never reproduce. Yeah, absolutely. And what does uh, marketing look like for uh, a marketplace like Bookshop, which is niche on one hand, but on the other, you have uh, millions uh, of SKUs, uh, I imagine. Um, and also you have a slightly different, a pretty different business model uh, compared to other e-commerce businesses. So how do you think about uh, marketing? Yeah, well, we have some challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that we are mission-based business and we're trying to give the most possible financial support to our stores. Right. So that means that our margins are very low when it comes to books. Our blended margins are about eight and a half percent. So with that kind of margin, you can't spend a lot of money on Facebook advertising to get new customers. 
You can use Google Advertising, okay, but um, anything that has a ROAS of four or worse is really off the table and eight is questionable. You really want a ROAS of more than 10, which is hard to get, right? And a lot of direct consumer companies have raised $40 million, $80 million from venture capital, and then they spend that money on customer acquisition and scaling as fast as possible. We don't have that ability. We didn't raise that kind of money from venture capital. We won't be able to because we're mission-based and that's gonna always yeah. kind of conflict with what they want. They're gonna wanna be able to exit the company and flip it. Um, we don't want that. We wanna be there for our community. So what do we do if we can't spend money to get customers? Well, we, we actually leverage the power of small communities. So we have communities like a podcast that talks about books and they bring in 150 customers and we give them an affiliate commission. So they're supporting their podcast by telling their customers about us, but they're also supporting independent bookstores because every affiliate commission we give, we match it as a donation to independent bookstores. Um, and if we bring in a bookstore, they might bring in a thousand customers. If we bring in um, Buzzfeed or a major media affiliate like the Atlantic, we can bring in, you know, 10,000 customers. And so all of these together combined um, are over 2 million customers now that we've acquired through leveraging these small communities um, and bringing them in. And then, you know, the, the affiliates market to their own people and bring them in. And so we don't have to spend that money. Um, we spend the money on affiliate commissions to those customers, but that's okay. That's kind of how we're, it's kind of our ethics because we want everybody to benefit from this model. This is like not a winner take all model. It's a winner share all model. And so everybody is supported. If you're an author and you use bookshop links, you can support yourself through a commission and you're supporting independent bookstores. If you're an organization, literary magazine, a literary festival, everybody can participate and support themselves and bookstores at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if I may get technical there for a second, uh, um, how do you, um, if you manage to do it, uh, um, how do you manage to measure attribution for these uh, um, more top of funnel um, awareness based channels, like uh, uh, let's say the podcast uh, um, or local communities uh, where uh, it's more about uh, word of mouth uh, than sharing links uh, most of the time. So th did you manage to um, crack that problem uh, or is it more about uh, um, just direction and trends over time? I mean, we can see if somebody actually sold it where they benefited a particular store or affiliate, we can see that of course, because that yeah. is done through a custom link. And so it um, we cookie that user when they come to the, to the site and we credit that transaction. So we know if, if Nebula was a bookshop affiliate and you had a certain number of sales, we could attribute those to you. That's easy. The top of funnel stuff um, is definitely trickier. We, we do have a kind of a dashboard and cookie system for the podcast advertising that we do. Um, a lot of it, um, we, are parsing things in Google Analytics and Data Studio um, and trying to track everything down. We don't have complete attribution for about, you know, for a significant amount of our traffic. Um, so it's still a work in progress. And, you know, with it, the solution, there are solutions out there that would give us more visibility, but they are expensive and we're trying to run lean. And so, you know, it's, it's a, I'm really interested to hear other people's solutions. It seems like something that very few people have cracked. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, I think the expectation uh, is also probably changing uh, a little bit uh, um, post ATT. Um, brands, uh, or at least the, the brands that I'm talking to, I see them becoming a, a bit more comfortable with the idea that you can't measure all the things uh, all the time which is something that we are used to in this industry because it was all about direct response and now it's not anymore all of a sudden and the channels are becoming harder to measure um so i think probably on a technical level um we'll be able to solve some of these problems uh, 
um, maybe there's a longer term trend uh, uh, where we become happy uh, with uh, just watching the numbers change uh, over time uh, and evaluating things over a longer time horizon. Yeah. I mean, I think something like Bookshop, generally books are a little bit less expensive on Amazon, right? So we're asking people to pay a little bit more money most of the time mm -hmm. because of our social mission and because they're, so they're kind of voting for their values with their dollars. Now, if, if a customer has never heard of us, or maybe they've seen the word bookshop, but they don't know who we are or what we're doing with that money, then um, why would they ever click on us if they're on Google search and they search for a book and it comes up in Google shopping and they see Amazon yeah. right next to bookshop. So Amazon is $17 and bookshop is $18 and they already have an Amazon prime account. So they're going to get free shipping. So why would they possibly click on bookshop? That's the only answer to that is top of the funnel marketing where you have to, you know, publicity and brand awareness, which is going to be really hard to track, but we can see it because we can see, oh, some people, when they see Bookshop on Google Shopping, they'll click that instead of Amazon or Target or Barnes & Noble or Waterstones or whatever. So those people we must have reached, right? So um, so that's kind of the the indicators that we can have is, What's our conversion rate for various channels that um, where our value proposition is not really visible? I wish that Google Shopping would have a way to put a little bit of information about your business on the card, but they can't. They can't even put 140 characters about yourself on the card. You can just put your brand, your, your company name and the price and the product name um, and like what you charge for shipping. Like we're never going to win if that's the only metrics that we're judged on, because there's no way to put anything about social responsibility in those cards. Um, so we have to tell our story and make sure enough customers know about our story so that they will choose us in these kind of neutral situations. Or if they're on the New York Times, and the New York Times has done a book review, the New York Times will have a buy this book button and it'll have a link to Amazon, a link to Bookshop. But again, mm -hmm. it doesn't say what that Bookshop link does. It doesn't say, this supports local independent bookstores. It just says bookshop. So if we don't do top of the funnel marketing and brand awareness, we're going to lose in all those situations. So it's really important for us, even if we can't track it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the the rise of zero click um, content uh, and zero click searches is something that uh, um, will change the landscape uh, a little bit. And it's something that we're watching uh, um, where everything is becoming a bit more standardized because third-party data is harder to access. It's harder to share data across platforms. Uh, every platform out there uh, is trying to own more and more of the e-commerce funnel. Um, but as a result, uh, if you don't have a, a very unique recognizable product uh, um, or, or a unique recognizable brand, uh, um, you're probably worse off than before because you, you don't get the chance to tell your story. Um, in those kind of channels, uh, um, unless they change uh, um, and improve on, on the functionality over the coming years. Yeah, it's going to be tricky. I mean, it seems like also, I also run some content websites and similarly, I'm a little nervous about it. Um, you know, they, they're much more likely to take an excerpt of an article and display that to the person to make them not need to click or with AI. Who knows what's going to start happening with book yeah. um, search results when people search for an author or a book with AI? Are they really going to list different retailers um, or different retailer links to buy it? Or are they just going to go with the biggest? There's a huge kind of gravitational force towards um, big business with all of these changes. Um, and also there's a lot of rent seeking behavior where they're just trying to like shave, like, okay, you can check out on Pinterest. You can check out on Facebook. You can check yeah. out these places and it's just 5% more, 5% of your, of your, uh, of your transaction goes to the, what we used to be a social media referrer to your site and now becomes, uh, like rent seeking, um, audience aggregator of some kind. I don't know where it all ends, but I do think it, it's a very challenging environment to navigate. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, brands started realizing that Facebook was uh, directing more and more of their audience to um, to Facebook shops and Instagram shops rather than a brand's own uh, T2C website. Uh, and it's, uh, um, I mean, it's it's double-edged sword. Uh, um, on, on one hand, it uh, it improves uh, the reliability of signaling and, and attribution and so on, and allows you to make better decisions. Uh, on the other, that's a customer that is transacting uh, on an external platform and not on your own website. Uh, and so that crea- creates a whole bunch of problems for you potentially. So um, I'm also not sure where it will land or how it will develop over time, but it's, uh, it's definitely interesting to watch. Yeah. And, um, well, so one thing I was uh, wondering, uh, um, on the other hand, is uh, for a business like Bookshop, it seems like uh, you might have very sticky customers uh, once you've acquired them because you have a very strong social mission. So once someone identifies uh, with those values, uh, uh, I guess they continue to to shop on your platform uh, and not somewhere else. So it's not something that you're seeing in general. We definitely have those sticky customers, and the, we we can see that customers that buy from us four or five times are basically mm-hmm. our customers forever. Um, we do have a lot of one-time customers, though, and so, and I think that's because of all of the referral links that are out there. That mm. there's like somebody could see us a link to Bookshop through uh, through a article on Oprah.com where Oprah says like buy from these. 10 black owned bookstores and they buy once and then they don't come back. Um, so we are working on that problem of how do we get those one time buyers to become four time buyers and what can mm-hmm. we do more like trying to use transactional emails more like people m- ignore marketing emails, but they generally do not ignore an email that says like your package is out for delivery. So how can we put more positive reinforcements and brand awareness in that, um, email and looking at all of our customer touch points, like every place that a customer interacts with us and figuring out how can we make them feel good about the fact that they are a bookshop customer? Cause that's ultimately the only reason somebody would shop from us is because it makes them feel good. Um, they feel good about supporting local businesses. They feel good about not, you know, kind of caving to the giant corporate m- monster that is Amazon and, and helping, um communities flourish and all that and so we need to make sure that they feel really good about it good enough that they want to go back and do it again so that's what we're working on now because you know the pandemic wind at our back was huge and for the first two years we you know we didn't have to worry too much about how perfect is our marketing um, and how yeah. perfect is our customer engagement because we could barely keep up with the demand. Now that the pandemic has subsided and customers have returned to stores, independent bookstore shopping is actually above levels of 2019. So they're above pre-pandemic levels in store. So for us now to grow and make more of an impact, we do have to start really getting very serious about customer marketing and getting really good at it. Got it. And when it comes to the tools that you offer uh, to the bookstores right now, do they have any um, ways to stay connected to their audience uh, besides that uh, um, marketing page? Yeah, they do. They Every bookstore gets their customer list so they can see all their customers and all their orders and they can export them into an email program um, or whatever they want. And we're also building um, we're doing a beta test right now of an automated email that could go to their customers as well. So mm-hmm. we want, we, we did a poll in the UK and it turned out that 21% of stores didn't even have an email list and um, almost half of them don't email their customers more than once a month. And the answers that they give are like, I'm just too busy or I don't understand it. Yeah, And so when you think about something as basic as that for e-commerce, the more that we do for them, the better. That's kind of the approach that I'm going to have is that if we can take something off their hands, that's going to help them sell more books. We'll do it ourselves. So we can do a 
like best new releases or a bestseller email. We can automate it, send it to their customers automatically, and then they'll see more revenue and they don't have to touch it. If they want to touch it, they can, but they don't have to. So we're looking to figure out other ways that we can automate and just kind of get the whole industry um, to be a little bit more savvy and better at selling online. Yeah, definitely. That sounds very cool. Um, and are you doing anything in the digital content space? Because that looks like uh, it's also more or less an Amazon monopoly right now that is ripe for another player. Yeah, we are working right now on an ebooks platform um, and audiobooks in the UK. Uh, so, in you know, Amazon owns Kindle, and Kindle has the majority of the ebook market locked up. And if I want to buy, if I read ebooks a lot and I want to support my local bookstore instead of Amazon, there's no way for me to do it. I can't do it. And if I'm a bookstore that wants to sell ebooks, I can't do it. So that's an obvious need. There's thousands of bookstores and ebooks are almost 20% of the book market. So opening that up, that revenue stream is going to be huge. And I also think that Amazon's dominance of ebooks has um, kind of squelched innovation and that there's a lot of innovation that can be done around ebooks that has, hasn't been. So I look forward to that part of it too. And maybe we can actually create an experience that people love and um, get some Amazon customers to abandon their Kindles for us. Um, and so that's going to be really important. That's going to open up more revenue to bookstores and it's going to help future proof bookstores too. as content changes. It's going to be really important for them to be able to have a platform where they can adapt. Like audiobooks, for example, are growing a lot. Um, and independent bookstores in the UK don't really have a way to capture that. So we're going to give them one. Yeah. Awesome. So are you saying we can expect to see a bookshop reader at some point? Bookshop reader and um, yeah, a bookshop app on Android and iPhone and also a web-based, browser-based experience. Um, and that will be coming in Q1 2024. Amazing. Um, how would you say um, the experience of building such a, um, a strongly tech-driven company uh, changes uh, the, the typical processes of running uh, an e-commerce business. Uh, does it require new skill sets, a uh, different uh, approach at building things? Uh, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I think it it does require new skill sets. I mean, for me, I had I had done a lot of businesses that had important digital components, but here we're trying to kind of invent a new platform and a new way of doing e-commerce for small businesses. And we want it to be able to scale and improve. So building a, a development team that was up to the challenge um, and who is also mission aligned has been an ongoing process. I feel like really good about where we're at right now. And um, just understanding that the investment will pay off because there's a lot of pressure to just say, okay, well, let's make Shopify work. Um, yeah. But if you, and if you do that, you might reduce your dev costs um, and speed things up somewhat, but then you don't have control of your business and you won't have any competitive advantages that everyone else doesn't have. Um, so if you really are interested in innovating, I think building it yourself is is the way to go. And we are trying to be more innovative than just like an average e-commerce shop. If we were just an online bookseller, it would be crazy for us to build everything that we're building. But we're not yeah. just an online bookseller. We're a collective kind of a, a collaboration of thousands of small booksellers all selling online. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel like that's a pretty strong component with marketplaces because your value add is not a product uh, itself. It's more a shopping experience. And so if you don't own the shopping experience uh, and the tech that powers it, you basically don't have a business. Uh, you just have a marketing plan. So I yeah. definitely hear you there. Um, and what else can we expect to see from Bookshop over the next year? Well, over the next year, it's pretty much what I've described. We want to build out 
the electronic books platform. Um, and so we're competing with Amazon's Kindle, we're competing with Amazon's Audible, we're competing with Amazon's physical books, and we're giving booksellers new revenue streams. We're also looking at all of our customer experience and all of our customer touch points to make them feel really good about shopping, looking at things like loyalty programs, um, mm -hmm. celebrating them when they've reached certain milestones, allowing them to do things like set reading goals and other things that will gamify the experience a little bit and make them very invested in what we're doing and and just making the site faster and better and improving our site structure improving like all the basic building blocks of an e-commerce business to take care of them so for the next year that's our focus um and then after that, hopefully we'll do some other new exciting stuff that'll that'll help us grow and become bigger. Awesome. And what's the ideal outcome for a bookshop? You mentioned that you're looking to build a, a business that can stand the test of time. I don't think you'll sell to Amazon for obvious yeah. reasons. So um, what's the, the ideal exit or not an exit? What's the ideal outcome? Yeah, I mean, the ideal outcome for me is that independent bookstores sell their fair share of books online, direct to consumer. Um, and right now, they're around 10% of the market in the US, um, the book market overall. But online, they're one and a half to 2%, right? So for my, my ideal outcome is that they grow five times the presence of, on, of independent bookstores grow 5x online and that in that case we would grow 5x and that at that point online revenue would be a really sustaining part of these businesses and it would make doing business as booksellers much easier it would make t t paying their staff fair wages much easier um so that's that's my goal for now and you know my crazy goal stretch goals are to take the bookshop model and apply it to other industries in the same way that Amazon started with books and then went into other verticals. Like I've got a local toy store that I love that almost went out of business during the pandemic. Toy stores are curators too. They could benefit from a model like bookshop and buying toys on Amazon is not a great experience. Um, you know, there's bike shops, there's beauty supply stores, there's hardware stores, there's all kinds of local small businesses that are all under great pressure because of the rise of giants like Amazon or Walmart and giving them an umbrella kind of organization and platform where they can have a market power that's the sum of their parts or more than the sum of their parts, I think is potentially really powerful and nobody has quite done it. And so, like a long, long term, 25 year legacy. That's what I really like to be able to do. We'll, we'll see if we get there. I need to get books right first. And we're yeah. only in year three of books. So a couple more years really focused on books and then we'll look at the rest of the world. I look forward to seeing that. Um, all right. I think that's it. Andy, thank you so much for your time. I think Bookshop is uh, quite frankly amazing uh, what you've managed to achieve. Uh, and uh, the kind of vision that you have for the business is something that is really rare in this industry. So I, uh, I look forward to seeing you succeed uh, over the coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.